Surviving Extinction with Catherine Williams from National Geographic. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week we're looking at Surviving Extinction. We're going to be talking with Nat Geo's Catherine Williams, editor of Weird But True. John! Earth has so far seen five major extinction events, with the sixth happening now thanks to global climate change. These global dying events wiped out vast numbers of species, reshuffling the deck of life. However, one power trio, the masters of survival, tardigrades, horseshoe crabs, and sharks, each strike off several of these calamities like it was a couple of bad gigs at a rundown barn. We're the masters of survival. Your extinctions are revival. Yeah, yeah. Let's rewind the clock to 443 million years ago, the Ordovician Silurian extinction. Uh, life just before this event was like a wild dance party in the ocean filled with creatures like this adorable little trilobite right here. Her name is Tilly. Say hello, Tilly. Hello, Tilly. But then, BAM! Climate change, sea level fluctuations, and an icy cold climate crashed the party. Most species were left wondering what happened, but not our hilarious heroes, the tardigrades. These little critters managed to shrug off the catastrophe and continue their adorable shenanigans, partying like it was still the Ordovician era. Incidentally, trilobites also escaped extinction this time, but their luck would run out Aww. eventually. Sorry, Tilly. Next on our adventure of life's little mishaps are the late Devonian extinctions, a series of die-offs stretching from 420 to 360 million years ago. Now, given the 60 million year long four act marathon performance of this extinction, it is unlikely one cause was responsible for the Devonian extinction event, but the rise of Devo hats as a fashion item may have played a role. But amidst the, cha the chaos, our ever-present sharks swam against the tide. These toothy jesters made sure that even if the waters got a bit murky, there was still going to be plenty of chuckles left for the future. Now, here comes the big one, Elizabeth! About 252 million years ago, the Permian-Triassic extinction, also known as the Great Dying, obliterated 95% of all marine species and 70% of terrestrial life. Now, picture a stand-up routine where 95% of the audience suddenly disappears. Kind of like my last live performance. <laughs> but, guess who had the last laugh? Horseshoe crabs, that's who. These masters of survival managed to ride out the apocalypse once more. Incidentally, this was also the first major extinction which cockroaches survived. <laughs> it would not be their last. Am I the only one here who likes cockroaches? Now, let's move to the beat of the end Triassic extinction, which dished out its destruction from 252 to 201 million years ago. Continental drift and 40,000 years of massive volcanic eruptions drove global temperatures up 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, acidifying the ocean. Marine organisms bit the dust far and wide, losing three quarters of their diversity. However, resilient survivors emerged from the ashes. 
enter the age of dinosaurs. Ancient reptiles called dinosauromorphs took the spotlight as the opening act for the age of dinosaurs. Finally, we shimmy our way toward the Cretacean Paleogene extinction roughly 66 million years ago. You heard about this one. It was the ultimate cosmic collision, the party crasher of all party crashers. A colossal asteroid hit Earth, triggering a celestial disco ball of de devastation. So, what? He's not going to mention that dinosaurs existed for 150 million years? Like, they're here. They're gone? Apparently not. Let's see if humans do that. Lame. Dinosaurs and trilobites met their end after 165 million years of roaming the planet. Yet amidst the chaos, mammals skirt amongst the shadows and birds seize the opportunity to come from the sidelines and claim the dance floor for themselves. While life all over the world perished time and again, sharks still played their regular gig in the oceans of Earth. Next up, we talk with Katherine Williams about Nat Geo Kid's new book, Weird But True. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to welcome Katherine Williams back to the show. She is an editor at Nat Geo Kids, and she's here to talk to us about Nat Geo Kids' new book, Weird But True, Sharks! And also, we're going to talk about sharks. Welcome back to the show, Catherine. <laughs> it's awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. Anytime. So... Uh, we're talking in today's show, this week's show, uh, about surviving extinction. And sharks are pretty much the masters of that. You know, they've, yeah, been, no, around, okay. yeah, yeah. they've been around 400 million years. What's, what, what's made them so successful? Yeah, sharks are incredible. They yeah, swam alongside the dinosaurs, survived all these mass extinctions, all of the ones on Earth. Um, uh, sharks are incredible uh, hunters. They're very good at what they do. I, I can't say definitively why, you know, sharks survived all of this time, but I think it has something to do with all of the senses they have that help them be us expert hunters, great swimmers. Um, we have some cool facts about shark senses in this book um, uh, that they have just senses that humans don't have. So they they can sense electrical currents that other animals are giving off. Every living thing, right, is kind of generating this electricity. And sharks have this incredible sense, these pores on their snout, that help them identify those animals and just sense where something is around it. They, I mean, the, the I think, often told fact, you know, the sharks can smell a drop of blood from incredibly far away. They have good eyesight. Um, they also can use is Earth's magnetic field to navigate extremely far distances. So they're very, they're super hunters. They have kind of like what we would consider superpowers, I think, if you could give a human some of these characteristics. Cool. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, so far the Earth has gone through five major extinction events. We're currently working on number six here. Um, but, you know, even, you know, people when people think of extinctions, you know, I think the first one that comes to mind is the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction 66 million years ago at the end of uh, the age of dinosaurs. 
Um, but even there, um, about 60, 70% of marine species went extinct. But sharks even, even looked over that one. I mean, is it because they have all these senses? What do you think makes them so adept at it's surviving extinctions? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, yeah, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> I, I really, um, they're incredible. I mean, they're something that I've learned from um, working on this book, and I'm also currently working on another book about um, sharks. Is that they're very diverse. They have a lot of ways of, of, um, of just being. So, like different ways of reproduction. I mean. Some sharks lay eggs. Some sharks have live birth. Some sharks live in very deep water. Some live in very shallow water, very cold, very common sizes of, um, you know, the size of a piece of toast to the size of a whale shark. Shark diversity is like very incredible. And the more I learn about them, I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is all the same, you know, type of creatures. It's, it's very, um, it's very incredible how, how diverse they are. Yeah, you know, just you know, doing a little bit of research before this, you know, I uh, found that, you know, sharks, as you say, can come anywhere from, you know, 15 centimeters long to 10 meters in length, you know, and can weigh as little as 30 grams or as much as 18 metric tons. Um, and it seems like this, the diversity may be one of one of their greatest survival strategies. Yeah, I mean, it definitely helps uh, survive any situation. I mean, there's like sharks right now living in like uh, a pool in part of a volcano system. It, it's incredible. Like there's uh, hammerheads that are swimming around inside of a volcano. And <laughs> I mean, they're just like ending up in these really weird places. Um, I think it's maybe a tiger shark. So there's, a, there's one type of shark or, or a few types of sharks that can actually swim through fresh water as well so if they need to get into a river for some reason for food or something like that they can swim um they can swim from the ocean into a river so i think they've been, been found like even in the mississippi river they they can uh survive in places that you might not expect sharks to be able to survive rivers lakes ponds backyard yeah. swimming pools <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hopefully not. But you know, <laughs> that if that would be a uh, weird but true sharks number two. If if anyone <laughs> finds that to be the case, let me know. <laughs> uh, and so, what are some of the coolest adaptations and you know neatest things that sharks have been do that makes them so cool? Uh, there's so many things. Um, I'm really, I really am enjoying like learning about the. Um, the Greenland shark. I the writers of this book. So the we have a team of writers and researchers who work on all of our books. And uh, my job is to kind of take some of the facts and decide which ones are weird enough. Make sure there's a diverse group. And the writers kept sending me facts about Greenland sharks. And at some point, we just had way too many facts about that particular kind of shark. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, this is too much. But it's a very weird shark. I mean, it's um, it's a very large shark that lives in very 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 cold water. Um, and scientists estimate they could live up to 500 years. Um, they definitely live over 200 years and they like don't reach like reproductive age until they're like 150 years old. So this is just like a lifespan that is, I think, incomprehensible to me as a human. And um, they, they swim super slowly under two miles per hour. And um, they have like, kind of like antifreeze compounds in their blood to keep them from from being too cold. So they're like extremely adapted to this very specific um, ecosystem. Uh, so that's a shark that I hadn't really heard of um, prior to working on this project. And um, it was just very, very weird shark. Yeah. So, you know, I keep thinking, keep thinking about these volcano sharks. And <laughs> <laughs> I keep coming back to these guys here. And I just want to know, uh, how, how long before the movie comes out? <laughs> I know, right? Um, <laughs> it, it also, it sounds a lot like Sharknado. So Sharkano, it's an easy uh, an easy pivot. Um, so if I could get some royalties for that. 
I, 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 I think we're going to need to cast Samuel L. Jackson in a lead role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, and um, so I'm wondering, like, you know, when we think about, you know, life on other worlds, you know, um, especially marine worlds, water worlds, uh, with life all around them, what, what, can we learn from sharks when we when we try to imagine what life might be like on other worlds? I think that I mean I, I mentioned that their senses are so unusual to us. Like I think that, uh, and I've seen a lot of books coming out recently about animal senses, which is pretty cool because we get pretty stuck in our own way of experiencing the world. Um, but if you're living in a water world, you you might need you're definitely going to need different things, um, different types of senses. Things will work in different ways. So um, I think they have, uh, you know, the senses that they need are different, the ways that they exist. Um, and I mean, they some, some sharks really do um, seem alien. Like, uh, for example, um, there's one... There, there are quite a few sharks that kind of glow a little bit. So they have bioluminescence. Mm. And uh, one of the ones we mentioned in the book is uh, uh, the ninja lantern shark, which is like expertly named. It, you kind of get what it is right away. Uh, <laughs> so it doesn't <laughs> act slow. Um, <laughs> I love that when like something, when a scientist names something and you're like, I get it. <laughs> no, I, I don't need it. No notes. Um, uh, but you see this a lot in like marine animals they they glow for different reasons um and uh sometimes it's to to stand out or attract you know prey for some reason but this one um the part of the ocean it lives in is uh a dim light so there's there's actually some light reaching in so it emits a glow that helps it kind of blend in with the lighting of the ocean mm -hmm. and then it sneaks up on its prey so that's something that i think you know, thinking about what living in the ocean is like different from living on land is that there's these like levels of darkness and zones that they have very cool adaptations to to, to live in. Hmm. And we normally think of sharks as being solitary creatures, but what are they like on a social level? Do they have networks and families on which they depend? Yeah, I mean, so I think for the most part, I mean, it varies species to species, and but they, I think for the most part, they are often solitary, but they do have, you know, they've been known to, um, I think we have a picture of, maybe it's nurse shark or cat sharks, um, kind of like cuddling <laughs> together, Aww. or like they all kind of are in a, a crevice together. Um, and I, I was, some sharks like have been seen hunting together and perhaps helping each other hunt. Um, They've done studies about shark personalities as some young sharks are more reserved, some are more um, outgoing. Um, so I think although they are, you know, for the most part, more solitary, there's a lot more to learn about their personalities and social um, cultures and, and things like that. Hmm. And uh, what, what would you say are people's biggest misconceptions about sharks? I think one of them is is that they're kind of just, I mean, they, they are hunting machines to a certain degree, but they're very smart. Um, they're not, uh, I think that this has been said quite a bit, but it's worth repeating. They're not you know, out to, to hunt people specifically. Um, and they, uh, uh, they're sharks swimming. They're in places humans never, there's su such a, Again, diversity of sharks are so many sharks, hundreds of species that we never encounter and that the shark attacks are we hear about are real, but they're I think, more memorable because they are they, they're, they're so rare um, that we, we they come to mind. But um, I think that's important to keep in mind um, and that they're also very important to protect because they're apex predators. They are a very important part of keeping our um, ocean ecosystem in, in balance. And so um, they have they have threats from us, particularly um, in like overfishing and uh, things like that. So it's worth keeping in mind that we, we should love our sharks, even though they're scary sometimes. 
Hmm. And as you mentioned, you know, we are now, you know, sharks are now facing one of their greatest threats of all time, which is, which is the human race. How, how yeah. what are, just briefly, like, what are some of the ways that, that sharks are, are being affected by human behavior? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the similar things that are affecting a lot of creatures. Um, for, you know, just first off, the general state of the ocean is not ideal. Um, we're, not, we're not doing a great job of taking care of our oceans, but also overfishing um, mm. uh, is a big threat for sharks. And, and people have been trying to protect sharks, making laws about fishing. Um, their shark fins can be uh, something that people uh, will sell. Um, and so it, it's kind of a hard thing to regulate, you know, on a worldwide scale. Um, but conservations are, are working on it. But overfishing, um, general ocean health is poor. Um, and, and those kinds of those kinds of things are threatening sharks and some species um, faster than others. But uh, definitely, we are it's it, it's it's sad to to the reality of the, the species that can survive all of these mass extinctions but we're um we're quite the quite the challenge uh mm. so uh yeah it's it's important uh for people to to care about them and finally speaking of which what can people do to to help protect sharks I think you can check out, you know, organizations that are, are working on, on shark conservation. Um, we, you know, our readers are kids, so it's, it's tough to, to tell them, you know, things that they can do. But I mean, uh, general ocean health, it's, it's always good to get started, like, you know, cleaning up uh, plastic pollution and things like things like that is something that kids can can do to get out there and, you know, make a difference before they have um <laughs> adult responsibilities <laughs> jobs <laughs> and just help them fall in love with sharks I think yeah. that too right I yeah. mean that's what we try to do with these books is like you never know what um what fact or image or whatever is going to stick with a kid and make them um whether it's sharks or some other creature just generally fall in love with the natural world and so like yeah. all of the books at National Geographic we're trying to ignite that love and like Especially, I think the weird factor is fun because it, it makes you realize you don't know what all is out there, and um, we want to keep it around so that we can we can discover it and get to know it better. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being coming back on the show, Catherine. It's always yeah. a pleasure to talk with you. You as well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime. And that was Catherine Williams, editor at Nat Geo Kids. Check out their new book. Weird but true. Sharks! <laughs> Conditions on other worlds are harsh, at least from the standpoint of an Earthling. Even the most habitable of worlds are no place to spend a holiday. Now life could saturate the cosmos, and life forms everywhere will face their own extinction events. The ability to adapt, to migrate, to move, assist species here on Earth in surviving extinction events. The same is likely to be true elsewhere as well. And perhaps some extraterrestrial beings possess a knack for genetic versatility capable of swiftly reshuffling their biological code, dealing themselves a winning hand to overcome impending doom. I'm Bick. And this is my partner, Triller. We're going to rearrange our genetic code to avoid extinction. And presto! Now, uh, here on Earth, extremophiles live in the most unwelcome environments. Alien life forms may thrive in conditions most or all Earthling beings would consider inhospitable. Some likely to take comfort on worlds with scorching temperatures, acidic oceans, or even in the depths of frigid interstellar space, finding refuge in cosmic corners that others fear to tread. 
Some extraterrestrial life forms might possess an uncanny ability to enter states of suspended animation, making them the ultimate cosmic nap takers. As their world faces a cataclysmic event, these interstellar dozers take a cosmic siesta, preserving their vital energies until the storm is past. With a celestial snore and a cosmic yawn, they then awaken from their slumber, ready to continue their otherworldly adventures. Now, intelligent life also offers the possibility of interstellar migration, as alien life forms might seek new cosmic frontiers to call home. Their ability to adapt, combined with the means and the willingness to travel beyond their planetary cradle, allows them to escape the clutches of extinction. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we offer up a traveler's guide to private spaceflight. We're going to take a look at the past and future of private spaceflight, talking with Ashley Vance, author of When the Heavens Went on Sale. Make sure to join us starting on the 27th of May. Now sign up for our newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com and never miss an episode of our show. Now, if you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, Please organize a flash mob to sing a tribute to our series performed at Times Square along with first-rate choreography, 76 trombones, all that. Yeah, if that's not possible for some strange reason, please comment, follow, share, and tell your friends about the show. Hey, mighty kind of you. Mighty kind. Clear skies. 